ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله we praise Allah we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds whoever Allah guides there is none that can lead him astray and whoever is led astray then there is no guide for him i bear witness that no god is worshiped in truth other than Allah he is alone and has no partners and i bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger o you who believe fear Allah as you ought to be feared and don't die except as muslims O oh, humanity fear your lord who has created you from a single soul and created from it its mate and scattered from them to many men and women and fear Allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and don't cut off relations with the wombs that bore you indeed Allah is a raqib over you O oh, you who believe fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that he may accept from you your deeds and forgive you of your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved the greatest achievement amma ba'du Certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most evil of affairs are newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'a and every bid'a is a strain and every strain is in the hellfire uh, continuing with our questions and answers on fit issues or issues uh, that we face every day we come to the question is it permissible to leave your house <coughs> going to other than the masjid in order to make your salah and we can phrase the question by saying is it permissible to have the intention on going to make the salah in other than the masjid <coughs> No, it's not uh, proper for the believer to leave his house and to go other than to the masjid in order to establish the five salat uh, that have been made compulsory on the Muslim men. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the authentic hadith, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَقَدْ هَمَمْتُ أَنْ آمُرَ بِحَطَبٍ فَيُحْطَبُ ثُمَّ آمُرُ بِالصَّلَاةِ فَيُؤَذَّنُ لَهَا ثم امر رجلا فيؤم الناس ثم اخالف الى رجال فاحرق عليهم بيوتهم and this is collected by al-bukhari and muslim where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says i swear by the one who my soul is in his hand that i wanted to gather up some firewood and then command the people to make the adhan for the salat and then command one of the people to lead the salat and then to go to those people who remain behind and to burn their houses down here the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is showing us <coughs> the fact that it is compulsory as imam al bukhari who put this hadith under the chapter that it is compulsory to make the jama'a salat or that it is compulsory for the men to make the five salat in the masjid as the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he wanted to gather some firewood and have the people lead the salat in the masjid and then to go to the houses of those people who didn't come to the masjid to make their salat 
and then burn their houses down. And the ulama, they use this hadith to show that it is compulsory for the men to make the five salat in the masjid. Also, there's the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and the companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who shows the same thing that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says but he puts it in a nice light and we'll mention it مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَلْقَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَ غَدًا مُسْلِمًا فَلْيُحَافِظْ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ الصَّلَوَاتِ حَيْثُ يُنَادَى بِهِنْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَرَعَ لِنَبِيِّكُمْ سُنَنَ الْهُدَى وَإِنَّهُنَّ مِنْ سُنَنَ الْهُدَى وَلَوْ أَنَّكُمْ صَلَّيْتُمْ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ كَمَا يُصَلِّي هَذَا الْمُخَاءِ هذا المتخلف في بيته لا تركتم سنة نبيكم ولا تركتم سنة نبيكم لا ضللتم ولقد رأيتنا وما يتخلف عنها إلا منافق معلوم النفاق ولقد كان الرجل يؤتى به يهادى بين الرجلين حتى يقام في الصف. and this is collected by Imam Muslim رحمه الله Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said whoever pleases to meet Allah tomorrow being a Muslim then let him guard these five salat where the adhan is called and where they are established as indeed Allah has prescribed for his prophet uh, sunnahs of guidance and the salat the five compulsory salat are from this sunnah, the sunnahs of guidance. And if you were to make these five compulsory salats in your houses, the way that the one who remains behind, who does not come to the jama'ah, makes his five salat in his house, then you would have left the sunnah of your Prophet wasallam. And if you leave the sunnah of your Prophet, you would go astray. Certainly we have seen that no one remained behind from these five salat except that he was a munafiq. It was very clear of his nifaq. And a munafiq is one who expresses Islam outwardly on his tongue, but in his heart he disbelieves. And one of us and a man would be carried by two men until they place him in the ranks to make the salah. So here Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's showing us that these salah were considered compulsory and that no one would leave them except that they were a munafiq, one who expressed Islam on his tongue but inwardly actually disbelieved in it from the committing the grave sin of not making the salah in the masjid without any excuse. The Messenger of Allah <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also tells us Salatul Jama'ati Ta'adilu khamsan wa ishreena min as-salati min salat al and this is collected by Imam Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the salat in jama'a is equivalent to 25 times more than the salat of a person made by himself. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's saying the jama'ah as the ulama of Islam explain the jama'ah is the group of people making the salat at the time of the iqamah in the masjid. That is the jama'ah. And this jama'ah is better than anyone making his salat other than that 25 times. <clears throat> the reason uh, this question had come up is because unfortunately People are leaving their houses and going uh, to make salat in other than the masjid. And the brother had phrased the question, uh, where are you going to make the salat? At the masjid or at the bank? Because people are answering nowadays, oh, I'm going to make my salat at the bank today. It has been established from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to make the five compulsory salat at the masjid. And those people who have been tested with making the salat at 4th Ave in the bank, instead of making the salat in the masjid, then they're not doing that which has been part of the sunnah of our Prophet wasallam. And if they continue to leave the sunnah of our Prophet, then they would go astray. So here we see, and this is advice to the brothers, and we had advised them, that no one should establish the five salat except in the masjid. 
not in the bank or in the store or any other place. However, as uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu mentioned, جُوِيَلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا وَطُهُورًا in the authentic hadith that this whole earth has been made a place of salah and a place of purification that wherever the Muslim is and the time of salah comes he can establish salah wherever he is. So if a Muslim happens to be at Fawthah, if he was eating, he got delayed or what have you and he made his salah at the bank then it would be permissible for him as the whole earth is a place for making the salah and a place for purification. However, this isn't to establish the salah. This is just because you're in passing or what have you. And whoever tries to establish the salah and other than a masjid, then he's not doing that which has been prescribed for him in Islam by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So we should be aware of leaving our houses, going to the bank or other than the bank to establish the salah as it's only been prescribed for us to establish the salah in the masjid. The next question, if I join the salah when the imam is in rukur, will that raka account for me? If a person enters the masjid and he finds that the people have already began the salah, if he joins that salah and they are in the rukur position or in the bowing position and he joins in and starts to say subhanahu rabbil azim uh, often, does he actually catch that raka'ah or does he have to make that raka'ah also? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic hadith collected by Abu Dawood says, إِذَا جِئْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ وَنَحْنُ سُجُودٌ فَاسْجُدُوا وَلَا, تع تع ولا تَعُدُّوهَا شَيْئًا وَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ الرَّكْعَةَ فَقَدْ أَدْرَكَ الصَّلَاةِ here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if you come to the Salah and you find us in sujood or in the prostration position, then I command you to prostrate <clears throat> and don't consider that to count as anything. Talking about that rakah that you entered in. And whoever makes the rukur, then that counts as a rakah. Here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is showing us a few things in this hadith as he's not only answering the question, he is saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if you come into the Salah and you find them in the prostration position or the sujood, then you are commanded to make the sujood. Don't wait until the Imam stands up and then join to catch it. As you say, oh that rock I already missed it, so I'll let that go and wait for them to stand up. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us to join them in the sujood position. And this goes for any other position that we find the Imam in and the Muslims in. When we enter, if we're a little late for the Salah, that we join them in that position, whatever that position is. If they're standing, we stand with them and continue. If they're in the rukur position or the bowing position, then we begin with them. If they are just coming up after the rukur, back to the standing position again, the qiyam, then we go to the qiyam with them. If they're down in the prostration of sujood, then we go down with them. If they're in the sitting position, whatever position we find them in, we have been commanded to join the salat with the position that they're in and not to wait until the imam starts up to start a nuraka. The Prophet Wasallam also establishes for us, as he says, whoever catches the raka catches the salat. And here this word raka as the ulama explain, it means the rukur. That whoever catches the rukur or the bowing position, then he actually catches that raka. For example, if the imam had just, uh, is beginning the first raka and he says Allahu Akbar after the recitation and he goes down to the rukur position. And you're coming in the masjid and everyone's in the rukur position and you join in Allahu Akbar and you go to the Rukur position, you have actually caught that raka with the imam. So you count that as raka number one. Or whatever raka uh, you're in or they're in, that's your first raka. And then you would uh, complete the salat with them. So here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam establishes for us if we catch the rukur, then we have actually caught that raka. 
and this is also the understanding of many of the companions as we quote, quote Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said man lam yudrik al-imam raki'an imam raki'an lam yudrik tilka al-raka' that whoever does not catch the imam while he's in the uh, bowing position of rukur then he has not caught that raka'ah and there are also narrations on other than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu showing that whoever catches the salah at the rukur position has actually caught that raka'ah <clears throat> we had a question and uh, I'll just repeat it and we'll save it uh, the answer actually for next week do I have to make up two sunnahs of fajr if I miss them the Prophet Sallallahu established for the believers to make two rakas of sunnah before we make the two rakas, uh, two rakas sunnah before we make the two compulsory rakas of Salatul Fajr. If we miss these two rakas, we make them up after Salatul Fajr, and inshallah next week we'll bring those hadith as I had a little difficulty uh, finding uh, the hadith for this issue, so inshallah next week we'll bring that. Is that Salatul Fajr? Is that Turaqa? Yes. Uh, the brother is adding, uh, those Turaqa Sunnah before the Salatul Fajr, is that between the Adhan and the Iqama? Yes, it's between the Adhan and the Iqama of Salatul Fajr. But we'll bring all of that next week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the next question is, tell me something that I can do to enter into Jannah. Tell me something that I could do to enter into Jannah. And I put this question here with the questions on the Salat, as we'll see that <coughs> the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had answered this uh, question in the chapters of Salat. As we have the hadith of Ma'idan ibn Abi Talha, Rahimahullah, who said, أخبرني بعمل أعمله يدخلني الله به الجنة أو قال قلت بأحب الأعمال إلى الله فسكت ثم سألته فسكت ثم سألته الثالثة فقال سألت عن ذلك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال عليك بكثرة السجود لله فإنك لا تسجد لله سجدة إلا رفعك الله بها درجة وحط عنك بها خطيئة قال معدان ثم لقيت أبا الدرداء فسألته فقال لي مثل ما قال لي ثوبان and this is collected by Imam Muslim معدان ابن أبي طلحة the tabi'i or the companion of the companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he asked Thoban, the companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell me something that if I did it I would enter into Jannah and this is actually the question that was asked that Allah would enter me into Jannah if I did that deed or I said to him what, which are the most beloved deeds to Allah so he was quiet. Then I asked him again, and he was quiet. And I asked him again for the third time, and he said, I asked the same question to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, I command you to make a lot of sujood, or a lot of prostration, referring to make a lot of salat, where the prostration is actually a part of, <clears throat> for Allah's sake. Because indeed, you don't make a prostration for the sake of Allah, except that Allah would raise you a level in Jannah, for that prostration that you made, and he would remove from you a sin for that prostration that you made. And then Ma'idan, rahimahullah, he said, Then I met Abu Darda, who's also a companion of the Messenger of Allah, and I asked him the same question, and he gave me the same answer as Thoban. So here we see that the Messenger of Allah, has given us a deed that if we did it, we would enter into Jannah, and that is to make a lot of salah. And inshallah ta'ala, <coughs> uh, maybe next week or in one of the coming weeks, we will bring some hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to show us which are the different times of the day when we would make salah, so as to make more salah, 
to seek the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being raised up in Jannah and having our sins forgiven, like making the two rakas before Fajr as we mentioned, or two or four before Dhuha and two after Dhuha and two after Salatul Maghrib, and two after Salatul Isha, and also the night Salat, as the Prophet ﷺ had established, anywhere from one raka to 11 rakas, and also the Salat of Duha, which is after sunrise to shortly before Salatul Dhuhr, where the Messenger of Allah ﷺ had established anywhere from two to eight rakas, and I think it might go up to 12 rakas, and then the Messenger of Allah ﷺ had established for us other salat as, as we have mentioned, two rakahs for entering your house and two rakahs for leaving, the two rakahs for entering into the masjid, the two rakahs that we make for uh, Salatul Istikhara, the two rakahs that we make that we want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us if we commit a sin. So inshaAllah ta'ala we will bring some of the text to show these times where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had encouraged us to make salah so that we can seek this reward of Jannah and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for His Jannah. We also see <coughs> from this hadith that that Tabi'i asked the Sahabi a question and that Sahabi answered him with I asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said and we always want to emphasize uh, as we're answering these questions, that we see that the people who came before us, that they made the answers to their questions. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said such and such. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said such and such. And this was always on the tongues of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as they are the ones who brought this uh, Deen of Islam to the rest of humanity, radiallahu anhum, ajma'in. And for that reason, no one could underestimate the position of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this deed, as they are the ones who pass this deed on to the generation after them, after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We also see that Thoban didn't answer the first time, though he knew the answer of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this could have been for reasons, and maybe the... <coughs> most likely reason is the reason that the ulama hint to often and that is the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said indeed lying on me is not like lying on anyone else and whoever lies on me has a seat prepared for him in the hellfire. Because of this, many of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the ulama of Islam, the scholars of Islam, at times are hesitant to quote the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for fear of lying on him alayhi salatu wasalam. So we also see the taqwa and of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they tried their best to stay away from lying on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu as they were bringing this deen of Islam to the people who came after them. We also see at the end of the hadith that Ma'idan ibn Abi Talha, rahimahullah, he asked another companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he got the same answer. He asked the same question to another companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he got the same answer. And from that we see that Islam is the truth <coughs> And that Islam doesn't have all of those differences because it's uh, based on the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we, take the, uh, if we take our questions back to the Qur'an and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and let Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to answer our questions with the verses in the Qur'an or as Prophet sallallahu to answer our questions with his ahadith that if you ask one million Muslims, so long as each one of those Muslims are quoting the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that more than likely the answer would be the same. And not like a person who saw a story and each person gives their own narration. But here we have that which has been uh, 
preserved from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we quote it to the people and teaching them their deen and then they memorize it and understand it and pass it on to the next person, then we see that how many Muslims, no matter how many Muslims you ask the same question, you get the same answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, the next question was, when is a person closest to his Lord? When is a person closest to his Lord? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Sahih Muslim answered that question, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدْ فَأَكْثَرُ الدُّعَى And this is collected by Imam Muslim. Where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, a person, a slave, a slave of Allah is closest to his Lord when he is sajid or in the prostration position so I command you to make a lot of dua in that position of sujood so here the messenger of Allah sallam, uh, not only informed us that our closest position to our Lord is when we are in our position of prostration saying subhanahu rabbil a'la but that in that position that we should make a, a lot of dua and that this is one of the positions or this is one of the times when we have been encouraged to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the good of this world and the good of the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. The next question is, I haven't memorized any Qur'an yet. What should I do when I'm making my salah? I haven't memorized any Qur'an yet. What should I do when I make my salah? And this question comes up often, uh, and it has come up probably to almost everyone in this room. If we remember yesterday when we accepted Islam, and we didn't know anything of the Qur'an, and the Muslims were making salat, and we were questioning, well, what do we do? We haven't memorized any of the Qur'an, <clears throat> as we know that it has been authentically reported on the Messenger of Allah Wasallam that he said, La salata li man lam yaqra bi fatihat al-kitab. And this authentic hadith, that there is no salah for the one who does not read uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. And in another narration, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, فَصَاعِدًا And more than that, that there is no salah for the one who reads Surah Al-Fatiha, who doesn't read Surah Al-Fatiha, and more than that, from the Book of Allah, the Qur'an. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Alhamdulillah has dealt with this issue as we see on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa who said Ja'a rajulun ila, ila al-nabiyyi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam faqala inni la astati wa an'akudha min al-Qur'ani shay'an fa'allimni ma yujzi'uni minhu faqala qul subhanallah walhamdulillah wa la ilaha illa Allah wallahu akbar وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ قَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ هَذَا لِلَّهِ وَمَا لِي قَالَ قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ ارْحَمْ قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ ارْحَمْنِي وَارْزُقْنِي وَعَافِنِي وَاهْدِنِي فَلَمَّا قَرَمَ قَالَ هَكَذَا بِيَدَيْهِ فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما هذا فقد ملأ يديه من الخير and this is collected by Abu Dawood in Al Nasai and Imam Ahmad and Ibn Hibban and this hadith is authentic. وعبد الله بن أبي أوفا he said رضي الله عنه that a man came to the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and said I don't have the ability to memorize any of the Quran. Or I am not able to memorize anything of the Qur'an. Or I am not able to learn anything of the Qur'an. So teach me what would be sufficient for me. Other than reading something from the Qur'an because I am not able to do so. And the Messenger of Allah Wasallam said, I command you to say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, that's for Allah. What's for me? And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Say Allah, اللهم ارحمني وارزقني وعافني واهدني. Oh Allah, show mercy on me. 
provide for me, uh, keep me in good health, health or in good general well-being, and guide me. And there's another narration, Waqfirli. So the man did like this with his hands, and the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said, "This man has filled up his hands with good." As he was counting that which the Prophet ﷺ had commanded him to say so as to memorize it. So whoever has just accepted Islam, and this is for all of us as we're calling the people to Islam, and they accept Islam, and we're going to teach them how to make the Salat, and bring them to the Masjid, and at first they're not going to be able to know what we say in the Salat. So we should teach them at least these statements that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Wala hawla, Wala quwata illa billah. And those five statements mean uh, glory be to, to you, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, you are free from every defect. All praise is due to Allah. No God has the right to be worshipped other than Allah. Allah is Akbar or Allah is the greatest and there is no power or might except by Allah. al Ali Azim, the Most High and the Magnificent. This is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the person had mentioned. He said, Ya Rasulullah, this is for Allah as these are statements.